Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, good to be back here for another week of work. We certainly have work to do. Uh, out across this nation, there are a lot of people that are still unemployed. And it's time for Congress to uh, take this extremely important task and to get it done. We've been talking here on the floor for a long time about how we can create jobs in America. And the Make It in America agenda that my Democratic colleagues and I have put, put forth over the last uh, two and a half years uh, is an extensive number of bills designed to bring jobs back to the United States. And we need them. An article that appeared in the uh, newspapers this last uh, day or so uh, talked about this. Uh, this is uh, Paul Krugman talking about the long-term unemployment uh, that we now have here in the United States. Uh, he cites that for the last uh, five years, we've been in a crisis. Unemployment remains elevated, with almost 12 million Americans out of work. But that's where the real striking and the huge number is in another category, and that's the long-term unemployment. 4.6 million Americans have been unemployed for more than six months, and more than 3 million have been jobless for more than a year. The programs that my Democratic colleagues and I have offered over the last two and a half years would have gone directly to that problem. Uh, Mr. Uh, he argues that, uh, that when you have this long-term unemployment, you create a problem that these men and women are not likely to ever get back into the workforce, uh, citing several statistics that are found around the nation. But we can do something about that. And the Make It in America agenda is exactly what we ought to be working on. Uh, before I go into the specifics of that agenda, I'd like to uh, cover one other issue. And this is seen in a report from the uh, International Monetary Fund that they just came out with a report in the last couple of days warning the United States to be very careful about continued reductions in our budget. They argue that the austerity program that the United States has actually been on for the last two years. Now remember, uh, immediately after President Obama became president, the United States took on a stimulus program, an enormous stimulus program of little over $700 million, billion, and that actually created the start of the rebirth of the American economy. But it only lasted for a year, year and a half. And then we undertook, at the behest of my Republican colleagues, an austerity program, one that involved seriously reducing the federal budget. Over the decades, beginning in 2011, we will see nearly $2 trillion reduction in federal expenditures in the 10-year period. That is what austerity is all about. And today, if you were trying to get on an airplane somewhere in the United States, you were beginning to see yet one more effect of austerity. And that is the air traffic controllers going on furlough so that one day out of 10 air traffic controllers will not be working, meaning that there will be a shortage. Some say, well, they should have moved the money around and they could have done it some other way, but that's not the way the austerity program is in the United States, and that's not the way the sequestration law is written. Sequestration is across the board cuts, expenditure item by expenditure item, with no or very little authority to shift money from one uh, lower priority to a higher priority. And therefore, today, the air traffic controllers, some were not working. And there was a general slowdown of air traffic across the United States, resulting in some of my colleagues not getting to work today to vote on the three bills that we had up here on the floor just a few moments ago. In any case, the IMF warns U.S. austerity will slow growth. This is a warning that was issued to the United States. It was also issued earlier to the United Kingdom, who, has been, who have been on a very serious austerity budget for the last three years. The result is that the United Kingdom is actually seeing a shrinking in their economy, as is most of Europe. Austerity did not work in Europe as an uh, effort to uh, 
deal with the downturn of the economy and the Great Recession. And it certainly is not working here. We need to create jobs in the United States. And a rational economic strategy would say that when you have a general decline in the economy caused by a lack of consumer spending, then it is time for the government to step in and to provide support for the economy. And we can do that in a way that actually is an investment strategy. And this is where I'd like to take this conversation. Instead of talking about austerity and cut, cut, cut at the federal level to deal with the deficit, an issue that indeed we must deal with, but that's a long-term issue that we have to get about. But we have a short-term crisis right now with employment and the lack of demand here in the United States. So what do we do about it? Well, first of all, we end sequestration give a rational way for the government agencies to address the $85 billion of cuts that are taking place in the next six months. Better yet, to put that off into the future. Let those uh, cuts occur in the years four, five, six, seven out in the future, rather than right now when what we ought to be doing is increasing the government expenditure on key investments, like keeping the airplanes in the sky, like keeping the men and women uh, who are at my Air Force Base in Travis, continuing to provide the support that the Air Force needs in moving men and equipment out of Afghanistan, and shifting those budget cuts off to the future. I hope that happens. I've asked my colleagues, and there are some, uh, certainly the President has asked for this to happen. We'll see if my colleagues here are ready to do that. So what do we do in the meantime? It's about investments. Those kind of federal government expenditures that actually will create immediate jobs as well as long-term economic growth. And there are several, and I'll go through them very, very quickly. First, education. The most important investment that any economy will make, any society will make, is the investment in education. And it's not just K through 12. It's the higher education system, post-doctorate uh, education, as well as uh, the retraining of those long-term unemployed who need to be prepared for the jobs of today and tomorrow, not the jobs of yesterday. So that's the education. The second piece of it is research. It's the foundation upon future economic growth. You need to have a robust research program if you intend for your economy to stay ahead. Fortunately, America has had such an agenda for a long time. However, the sequestration cuts, for example, $45 million out of research at the University of California, Davis, in just the next six months. That means layoffs, layoffs of technicians and others who are involved in those research programs, and it means that those research efforts will not come to fruition in the near future. They will be delayed, and the benefit of them will not be seen for some time. And some of this is real jobs right away. For example, some of that research has to do with bioherbicides and biopesticides. These are naturally occurring organisms that occur somewhere in the environment. They are discovered. They are brought back to the laboratory and grown and become a bioherbicide or a biopesticide. Research in that area is clearly going to be delayed as a result of sequestration. So let's delay the sequestration, put it off in the future years so that we can grow the economy today. The third element of economic growth is in the area of infrastructure. You have to have infrastructure. And this is about moving Americans across uh, our landscape. This is about our ports, our highways, our airports, and other critical elements in the transportation infrastructure. We know that we are woefully behind on meeting the infrastructure needs. Probably one out of, uh, excuse me, eight out of 10 bridges in the United States are deficient. We know that uh, our highways are filled with potholes and don't measure up to the standards that we would want simply for the protection of our automobiles suspension systems. We know that there's far more to infrastructure than just highways and ports and airports. For example, the Mississippi River is flooding. So what is the status of levees in the United States? Well, the status of levees in the United States is not good. 
In my district, I have more than 1,200 miles of levees, and many of them are insufficient to protect the uh, people who live on the land side of the levees, the farms and the cities. One of the most dangerous cities in the United States is Sacramento, California, ranks number two after New Orleans. We need to have that levee repaired, yet the Army Corps of Engineers is taking a $250 million cut in its levee budget and in the projects that it does in uh, deepening the ports and maintaining the ports. Makes no sense that at a time when we know that there is severe flooding, even this day along the Mississippi, that we would take $250 million out of the Army Corps of Engineers budget. But that's precisely what is happening with sequestration. So infrastructure goes beyond that. I'm going to come back to infrastructure in a few moments, uh, but I see I'm joined by one of my colleagues, uh, and I'll just rapidly finish with the other two elements in a uh, program for building the American economy. The final two elements are manufacturing. You have to make things. I'll come back and talk about that in a few moments. And the final element is you must change. The economy is changing. People have to change with the economy, our education system, our infrastructure. All of these require that we are willing to change. Now, my colleague from the great state of New York. Ohio. Hey, Ohio. Well, near the New York border, is it not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Please. Share with us your thoughts on sequestration jobs and uh, what we can do here in the United well, States I, to put thank, people back to work. I thank the gentleman, and I, uh, in line with what you were talking about uh, on the uh, infrastructure piece, I think it's important that we take a look at uh, what investments need to be made in the country. And we, we're, we're living, unfortunately, in a narrative in the, in the country where everything that the government invests in is a waste of money, according to some people here in the United States Capitol. No investment that the government could make could possibly be a good one. So we are forced into a discussion of either you're a socialist and the government should, uh, bureaucrat should be CEO of the company, or nothing. And what the Democrats are trying to articulate is for us to reestablish the formula that led to the great economic expansion here in the United States. We had figured it out. We figured it out. We, in just a few hundred years throughout the Industrial Revolution, this new country figured out how to make investments, how to protect intellectual property, how to protect private property and how to make investments in certain things that were going to yield dividends down the line, that were going to help business and workers alike, all at the same time. And that formula was invest into infrastructure, invest into roads, invest into bridges, invest into ports, invest into airports, invest into research, invest into the space program, invest into military research that eventually would spin out into the world. We had the formula. Invest into our workforce, public schools, universities, GI Bill. Pretty simple formula. This is not brain surgery we're talking about here, but it worked in this little country that was fairly small and really insignificant at one point became the industrial powerhouse of the entire world because of that genius of public-private investments. And of course the private sector came in and made big investments. Of course they did. That's what they do. But our job here is, in some insta instances, is to get out of the way, and we're all in agreement there that of course the government can get too much in the way and we've got a streamlined government, the tax code's too complicated, it needs to be simplified. We can do all that without having to disinvest or eat the seed corn that is the future economy of the United States of America. And why I love to join my friend here from California is because every time he comes to the floor, he's talking about how do we make investments today that are going to pay us dividends down the line. And when you talk about infrastructure, you're talking about making investments that are going to put, for the most part, 
building trades workers to work who make a decent salary, a good salary, good benefits, good health care. And then they go out, you have a road built or a bridge built, and the painters and the iron workers and all these projects, sheet metal workers, they all come and they build some, and they all got some money in their pocket. Then they go down the street, and they go to Home Depot, and they spend some money there. They buy a house or add a room or put a pool in, or they, they invest. They send their kids to college, and the whole thing keeps going. That's what we're talking about here. Mr. Ryan, uh, your lesson on American history is right on. We often hear some of our colleagues talk about the founding fathers. The founding fathers wouldn't do it this way, they wouldn't do it that way, or they would. Very interesting that George Washington, on becoming president, first president, went to Alexander Hamilton, his treasury secretary, and asked Mr. Hamilton to develop a strategy to grow the American economy. Alexander Hamilton came back with a, a report uh, three or four months later, laid out a half a, about a dozen different elements, and in those report that Alexander Hamilton brought to the pre President Washington was the genius of what you just described. He said the federal government should provide for infrastructure investment. Didn't call it infrastructure. Federal government should build canals, ports, and roads. He also said the federal government should buy American-made products to encourage manufacturing in America. So this is not new. Your recitation of American history down through the line actually began with our very first president, laying out the partnership, the public-private partnership, the federal government playing a key role in those investments that create economic growth. Right. And if you look comparatively speaking now to what China's doing, what India is doing, granted they're developing countries, but they're spending seven or eight percent of their GDP on infrastructure projects. And here in the United States, we're spending maybe two. And I know we are not a developing country, but we do have major investments to make in our cities, in our rural areas, whether you're talking about uh, combined sewer uh, systems, whether you're talking about water lines, whether you're talking about uh, dealing with the septic systems in rural areas, whether you're talking about bridges. I think in my biggest, in, in Trumbull County, where I live, I think we have 60-some bridges that are deemed not adequate. Unsafe. Unsafe. In one county in Ohio, and there's 88 counties, and we have high unemployment, much higher than any of us would want. And yes, we have problems, but the federal government is getting money at 1%. And I know my friends, and I'm in the budget committee, and we talk a lot about deficits and everything else. I know a lot of people would say, what, you can't borrow in our way out of this. And what we're, I'm saying, my argument that I'm making, I don't want to attribute anybody else to this, is that we've got major billion dollar, hundreds of billions of dollars, probably the Society of uh, Engineers says a couple trillion dollars worth of infrastructure needs over the next decade or so. Why wouldn't we invest into these projects. They say, well, you've got to borrow the money. We're going to borrow the money at 1%, maybe a little higher, depending on the day or the week. That project that we can do today is going to be a certain price. It's going to be $100, say. What's that project going to be like in five or ten years? It's going to be that much more expensive. Labor is going to be more expensive. Energy costs are going to be more expensive. The raw materials are going to be more expensive. Cement's going to be more expensive. Steel's going to be more expensive. Brick, every, go right down. Everything's going to be more expensive. And part of the problem with the Treasury is we don't have enough people working paying taxes into the Treasury. So to me, you get a twofer. And it's not like the project doesn't need to get done. This is not make work. This is something that needs to get done. Let me give you an example. Uh, the American Public Works Association. These are people that sanitation systems, water systems, and the like uh, estimate that 25% of all of the 
fresh treated water in our municipal water systems is lost to leakage. And they estimate, uh, together with the EPA, that we need to spend over $300 billion immediately to deal with sanitation systems in the United States that are inadequate, and $335 billion in drinking water so that we have clean, available drinking water. One more point here. For every billion dollars we spend, you put 28,000 people to work immediately. Those are the engineers, the draftsmen, the architects, the uh, men and women that are operating the equipment, that are uh, backfilling the ditches, laying the pipe. And if we use another strategy that we've developed on the Democratic side called Make It in America, if you use our taxpayer money to buy American-made equipment, then in your district, the steel mills begin once again to produce American-made steel. And all of the pipe and other equipment that's needed can be produced in America using our money. And I love your example of the 1%. There have been democratic proposals, and in fact, the President talked about it here at his State of the Union, about creating an infrastructure bank. If you take that short, or that 10-year or 15-year money that the government can borrow at a percent to maybe a percent and a half, put it in an infrastructure bank, and then loan it to those cities and municipalities and counties and others that need to build these systems, well, you take, uh, let's say, we borrowed a percent and a half, and you loan it out at 1.6%. <coughs> That's enough to pay that back. We circulate that money in our economy. We use that money to buy American-made products, and we get this economy moving. It's there for us. We can do this. If only we put our minds to it, set aside for a moment the deficit issue. I said a moment, not forever. We know we have to deal with the deficit, but you cannot solve that deficit unless you have Americans working. And we can put Americans back to work. And, 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 and unleash, I believe, unleash a new economy. I mean, that's, we're, we're, whole, we're strangling the economy right now because we're not making the kind of investments. And again, when you look at our competitors, because, you know, I'm from Northeast Ohio, we play a lot of football and we, there's a scoreboard. There's a scoreboard. And America's not going to win every game, but we better be in a position where in the, in the global economic competition that we are competitive and we know what makes us competitive. And I'm not saying it's all about making money. A lot of this stuff that we're talking about is quality of life. We won't get into health care or preventative medicine or anything like that, but we have human beings in Virginia and major towns all who are stuck in traffic for two hours in a commute in and out of a city. And we're not investing in the high-speed rail, which it would be another job creator and good for the environment and a new industry. And it would help develop and spread new technologies. So we are not leading right now. We have status quo. And I hate to say this, but we have a lot of people who want it to be that way. They want the Congress to be dysfunctional because they don't necessarily like government. And you don't have to be enamored with government, but you do have to recognize that there is a role to be played here. And, you know, if you play sports, you think you read the newspaper, you watch a football team, it's the quarterback, it's the wide receiver, it's the running backs, it's the skilled position people who get all the press. But none of that works. And let's say that those are people of the private sector. They're the CEOs that we worship. Well... Within that team, there are linemen, there are blockers and tacklers and linebackers and people that are in the, in the guts of the game, on the front lines, making it happen so that this other stuff well, can happen. If I might just interrupt you for a moment. The infrastructure is the blocking and tackling. It doesn't make the headlines, but it does what needs to be done in order for all of the other stuff to work. Uh, you reminded me of my college football career at the University of California, Berkeley, where I was an offensive guard and a defensive tackle, blocking and tackling. So this resonates with oh, you. It resonated yes. with me just fine, along with a lot of bumps and bruises and cuts and the like. Uh, 
but, but this is the public-private partnership. This is the role of our government to make these critical investments, critical investments in education, in the research. Uh, in fact, one of the Make It in America agenda items is the extension of the research tax credit and a, and a permanent or at least a long ex extension of it. Uh, Rep uh, Representative Carney uh, has in introduced uh, House Resolution 905 that would extend that. Uh, we have been extending it one year at a time, but that doesn't give the businesses the opportunity to plan on a long extension or a long period of time for research. For example, I was at um, Genentech. In my district, they have a major uh, biopharmaceutical uh, program there, uh, biggest pharmace biopharmaceutical plant in the world, and they conduct a lot of research. But the start-stop of the research and development tax credit makes it difficult for them to plan long into the future. So this piece of legislation, part of the Make It in America agenda, does that extension and gives this certainty to businesses. We also have the uh, infrastructure bank be reintroduced uh, by our colleagues here on the Democratic side. This is one of about two dozen bills that the Democrats have introduced for the purposes of moving the economy by bringing the manufacturing back home. We also have the Patriot Corporations of, of America Act uh, by um, our representative Tchaikovsky from uh, Chicago that rewards companies when they bring the jobs back home. Previ previously and even today, American corporations can take a tax break for shipping jobs offshore. They don't get a tax break when they bring those jobs back home. We want to reverse that. There's a series of bills. I call uh, the attention of the Congress to these bills that make it in America agenda so that we can once again make it in America. Not only make things in America, but the Americans can make it. Infrastructure, critical element of this. And when you look at manufacturing, uh, which the R&D uh, component leads to partnerships with, you have two problems. One, one is it's year to year, so you can't plan your long term, as you said. But at the same time, the budgets for the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, have been inconsistent as well. Those are things that we need to ramp up. And those aren't huge money items, but those yield a lot of value. So extend the R&D tax credit. Beef up National Science Foundation. Beef up National Institutes of Health. Beef up the research in the Department of Energy, public-private partnerships. Lay that groundwork for the private sector. Help the private sector. We had a group of CEOs in last week um, uh, that were in, in the semiconductor industry. They talked about the same thing. And they talked about the public-private partnerships and how that's needed for us to maintain our competitiveness here. And these are good-paying jobs in upstate New York and other places. And these are the kind of investments that we need to make. Again, we've got to get out of this mentality that every single thing that the government does is bad. There are some things, and it's the public-private partnerships that are going to ultimately lead the way for us. Well, Alexander Hamilton and George Washington had it correct. The American government working with the private sector can make the difference. Um, when we talk about infrastructure, we have an opportunity this year, Congress, and the president to make a huge impact, to make a huge impact on American jobs. We are going to rewrite uh, this session the Surface Transportation Act for America. Now, Mr. Rahal and I have authored an amendment or a bill that we hope becomes part of that uh, Surface Transportation Act that simply says, as we spend the taxpayers' money, this is money that's collected from the gasoline and the federal and the diesel excise tax, that that money be spent on American-made steel, concrete, bridges, uh, buses, trains, whatever. And it can work. One quick example. In the stimulus bill, there was an opportunity for Amtrak to buy uh, new locomotives, about half a billion dollars to be spent on these new locomotives. In that section of the law, one sentence was added that said, these must be 100 percent American-made. Nobody was making locomotives in America before that, but Siemens, the German corporation, 
Uh, one of the biggest manufacturers in the world said, oh, half a billion dollars. We can make locomotives. In America? Sure. In Sacramento, California, they opened a manufacturing plant, probably somewhere between two and 300 people working there today, manufacturing 100% American-made locomotives. And on May 13th, three years after they began this process, the first 100% American-made locomotive in probably more than a century rolls onto the tracks of America. We can do this. And Mr. Rahal's uh, bill, H.R. 949, will provide that opportunity, American-made, using American taxpayer money. I have another bill that does the same for solar and wind projects. So we can do these things. We just need to put our mind to it, get past this business of, um, of austerity. We cannot solve this problem of American jobs with an austerity budget. We've seen it fail in Europe. We see it failing here in the United States as the long-term unemployment uh, continues to harm four and a half million Americans uh, that have been out of work for more than six months and another three million that have been out of work for more than a year. We need an investment strategy, a make it in America strategy, an investment strategy in those things that create long-term economic growth. Mr. Ryan, I thank you very much for joining us this evening. If you'd like to wrap and then I'll wrap and we'll call it a night. Yeah, well, I, I'll just add uh, lastly, to me, it's about exciting the country and, and getting the country excited about what the future of America is all about. And tax cuts for the top 1% of the people and austerity for the rest is not a vision for an exciting America that young people want to come into. And, and the, the, uh, we want the private sector is going to be a huge part of this, but there are things that we need to start doing here. Our, whatever the percentage is that, that the government's role is in investments, I don't know what that number is, but we're not doing it. And we're, there's, no, there's no aspirational vision to excite young people to say, man, the, we're going to the moon, or we're going to go energy independent, or we're going to have high-speed rail that's going to connect the entire country. I think the president has desperately tried to provide that vision, only to be pulled down um, to, you know, the depths by by some of the folks here who I think have a completely different agenda, and that agenda doesn't align with the America that that was built uh, over the past century or so. Well, Mr. Ryan, I thank you so very much for joining us this evening. We're still the strongest, best country in the world. There's no other place like America. And if we begin acting like we can and are, that is a strong, robust, building, growing, dynamic country. Instead of being weak, pulling ourselves back and saying, oh, we can't do it, we can't do it. No, we can do it. We can build. We can invest. And every time we invest a dollar in infrastructure, we put Americans back to work. We give them an opportunity to take care of their family, to stay in their home, to provide for their children's education. And when we do that, we create the foundation for future economic growth, whether it's education or research or building the infrastructure or making it in America. As we do these things, this agenda is the American agenda, the one that created this country. As you so well said when you opened here, it's the American history. It's there before us. We can do it. We must do it. We owe it to the American people. Mr. Ryan, thank you. Mr. Speaker, you. we yield back our remaining time. The gentleman yields back.
Tell me when. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentlewoman from Alabama, Ms. Roby, is recognized for 60 minutes as a designee of the Majority Leader. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. It is a um, privilege to be on the floor tonight uh, for the next few minutes, and I hopefully we'll have some other colleagues joining me here in a few minutes. But tonight is about making life work, making life work for American families. What are we doing on behalf of the American people here um, in the House of Representatives to make life a little bit easier for working families, working moms and dads? And let me just say that, um, you know, there are things across the board, whether it's health care issues, energy, um, reducing the deficit and the debt for Margaret and George, my two kids, and future generations, um, all of those things add up and matter. Um, I want to talk for just a few minutes about one proposal that I have uh, in front of the House of Representatives that's going to come up for a vote here um, after we return from our district work week. But before I do that, I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, tonight that we're going to do something a little bit differently um, <clears throat> in an effort to engage uh, individuals in their interest about making life work for American families. I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, that um, if, if someone wants to know more about what we're talking tonight, uh, the hashtag on Twitter is Making Life Work. Uh, we want to hear uh, from uh, the people that we represent, Mr. Speaker, throughout our time on the floor tonight. And so I would just um, say to you again, Mr. Speaker, that any individual that would like to know more about what we're talking about or would like to engage in the conversation, it's hashtag making life work. Um, and uh, with that said, uh, I want to very briefly talk about, before I um, introduce my colleagues who are going to engage in this conversation, um, the Working Families Flexibility Act of 2013, which is a bill designed to do just what we're talking about tonight, and that's make life work, make life a little bit easier for working moms and dads. I'm a working mom, uh, and I, my husband and I both uh, every week sit down and figure out what the plan is. We have an almost eight-year-old and a four-year-old, and um, we certainly understand the pulls on the American family in balancing uh, the work week and our home life uh, and supporting our children. And, um, Mr. Speaker, there are a lot of families out there right now that would like choice in the workplace, uh, hourly wage employees, that would like the choice in the private sector to exercise compensatory time that's paid time off in lieu of cash wages. Um, right now, under current law, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, public employees can offer to, uh, public employers can offer to their employees that option. In 1985, the Fair Labor Standards Act was amended to allow that. Private sector employees can't. So again, as a working mom who understands the pulls on families, maybe that t-ball game at 4 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon or the uh, PTA meeting that's at 9 o'clock in the morning when my daughter's class is the one leading the charge on the entertainment for the PTA meeting, um, if I'm an hourly wage employee and I want to exchange paid overtime for paid time off, I cannot legally, under the law, do that with my employer. This amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act allows for the private sector to do what the public sector is already doing. Now, some of the opponents of this bill say that the big bad employer would use this to coerce employees into taking comp time rather than uh, overtime pay. That is unlawful. The same protections that are in place currently under the Fair Labor Standards Act um, are the same protections that exist under our amendment, preventing intimidation, coercion, discrimination by the employer um, on the employee. Um, and the most important thing about this bill is that it is voluntary. The employee is the only person who can opt to exercise 
this option if the employer chooses to offer it. We know that this is not necessary, necessarily an option in every line of work. Uh, for example, if there's a manufacturer with 10 employees who actually make a product, if you pull one person off the line, they can't make the product. Um, so it may not be a fit. But for those that want to, this amendment allows for that individual um, to say to their employer, I would like to enter into a voluntary written agreement with you uh, to use compensatory time to bank up to 160 hours within a 12-month period of compensatory time because time is more valuable than money to me. And the greatest protection in this bill is if, in fact, that employee determines at any time that this isn't working, uh, I don't, I'm not using my compensatory time, or I can't find a time that works with my employer that fits um, the time that I want to take off. That employee, Mr. Speaker, that employee can say, I want to cash in, or cash out, rather. I want to cash out my compensatory bank time. So let's say they've got 60 hours. They can cash out, and within 30 days, their employer have to pay them time and a half overtime for that banked uh, accrual of comp time. This bill makes sense. This bill is about helping working families. This bill is about allowing that mom and dad that are balancing um, t-ball games and um, PTA meetings as well as caring for um, their elderly parents. This bill is about military families getting ready for one spouse to deploy, to have the flexibility to do what they need to do. Um, this is one example about how we're um, making life work uh, for, for American families. This bill doesn't solve our debt or deficit problem. Um, I'm the first to admit that. But what this family does is it eases um, some of the hardships on our moms and dads in the workforce. And um, I'm really thrilled to be the current author of this bill. It has a long history. I'm excited about taking it to the floor in two weeks. Again, Mr. Speaker, for those who want to know more in tonight's discussion, um, hashtag is making life work. Uh, we want to hear from all Americans that are affected by any of these issues and uh, look forward to addressing those throughout tonight's era, uh, hour. Excuse me. Um, I want to let you know that uh, joining me tonight, I have the gentlelady from Washington, Jamie Herrera-Butler, as well as the gentleman from Colorado, Corey Gardner. And at this point, uh, to my colleagues, um, I would like to just open this up. But Corey, I know you currently serve on the Energy and Commerce uh, committee, and I, I know you've got a couple of topics that you want to talk about, but let's talk about making life work for American families when it comes to energy. Well, and, and I thank you for your leadership on, on this issue tonight, and uh, thank you for appealing to the American people so that we can hear from, uh, hear from them, so that we can have conversations with uh, people who are, are struggling to make ends meet, people who are finding innovations to make our economy work to uh, find those things that are going to lead our country forward. And so it is a, a great opportunity and privilege to be here with you uh, talking about ideas from the Working Families Flexibility Act that you mentioned that you're working so hard. I'm a proud co-sponsor of that bill, but also ways that, that we are going to find solutions for people across this country who are raising families, trying to uh, pay for college, uh, trying to pay the energy bill for the month. And I, I think we, we in Congress have an incredible opportunity to, to get government out of the way and to let America work, uh, to unleash the innovators and the entrepreneurs around this great nation. Uh, over the past several months, over the past couple of years, we've held uh, dozens of town meetings, uh, whether they're in southeastern Colorado, northeastern Colorado, uh, the, the, the Denver metro area and the new parts of, of my district, uh, talking to families, talking to uh, people who who've, are struggling to make uh, ends meet, to people who have had to pick up a second job uh, just to try to pay the bills. And as we talk tonight about making life work, life work and I believe you said the hashtag was hashtag making life work. I would love to hear from, uh, from uh, you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, people around the country on what really does make life, life work for them and how we can help be a part of these solutions. And so 
as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee from a, a district in eastern Colorado, have been working on uh, policies like energy to make sure that uh, energy continues to be an affordable option for families, uh, an affordable commodity, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's uh, simply going home after work to turn the heat on in a cold winter. It, it, I drove this morning uh, from Yuma, Colorado, all the way to Denver. It usually takes about two hours. Uh, this morning it took about four hours thanks to another big snowstorm, but here we are late April and the heat is on and what we're doing to make energy affordable so that families can afford that, uh, so that families in the, heat, in, the, in the middle of the summer can afford to, uh, to run their, their air conditioner, uh, drive to the family baseball game. Uh, it is about creating opportunity for families and we have an incredible energy renaissance in this country, a revolution really, uh, when you're talking about energy. Uh, in eastern Colorado, we have seen new technologies that can produce American resources that must and have to be a part of an all-American uh, all energy plan, an all-American energy plan that will rely not on somebody thousands of miles away from us, not on somebody overseas, but right in our own backyard, our neighbors, maybe our family members, people in our communities who can produce the energy that we use each and every moment of our lives to better the lives of our families, to create uh, the next product that will, that will ignite an entire economy. But we can't do that unless we have an affordable energy policy. And that's why an all-American energy plan is so important. And that's why it's an absolute and fundamental key uh, to making life work for so many people across this country. What we can do with natural gas, a clean burning fuel created right in, uh, manu developed, uh, uh, extracted right in Colorado. What we can do to uh, use the oil, the wind power, the solar power that we are uh, utilizing in Colorado to make like life work for families. And how does life work? I think we're all uh, facing that each and every day. We've got two kids. Uh, struggling to, to get from place to place, trying to make sure that we're, uh, whether it's our, our daughter's, uh, daughter's school work, whether it's our, our son trying to make sure that he's uh, figuring out how to ride the tricycle, he's young enough, we're trying to teach him that. But we all struggle each and every day how we are indeed going to make life work, and part of it is energy. What we can do to uh, create a policy in this country that will develop uh, a, a cheap, abundant, affordable policy that allows businesses to grow. And it's an exciting future that we face, knowing that we can do that right here in our own backyards. Right, and I, I, I can tell you as a mom of two kids as well, um, every week that I get on a plane to come back to Washington, there's a lot of planning that goes um, into it. And, and I put the gas in my car, I go to the grocery store, and when it comes to energy, I can watch ener energy prices affect the cost of food. Um, one of the things that I do every week um, just to ease some of the juggle in our lives is I try on the weekends to cook a few things. I love to cook, but I try to make life a little bit easier by, you know, having a few things in the refrigerator already made uh, that I do over the weekend. And so usually my grocery store visit um, is on Saturday and Sunday. Now, I, do, I, I tell folks that, that sometimes it can amount to a town hall. You get in the produce section and, and you have great conversations with your constituents. But, um, but I, can see, um, um, I can see what the gentleman from Colorado is saying as the price of milk goes up. If gas prices are increasing, then the cost of food is affected. And so um, I can tell you and, and your wife would say the same. Thanks for helping us in your role um, um, on energy and commerce. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I, too, believe that we need to be about the business of the American people and helping them make life work, um, which means helping them uh, in their day-to-day -day activities, not making it harder for folks to survive. I'm from southwest Washington, and in our neck of the woods, um, we have a, a lot of working class families. Um, who, like Corey mentioned, are struggling to make ends meet. I, we all know people who have been or are unemployed, um, where both parents, one or both parents is out of work, or one or both parents are trying to work, people are working two jobs, um, and still, they're working longer and harder, but not getting paid more for it. So folks are draining their 401ks to make their mortgage payments. This is the climate in which we find ourselves, and that's why it is so, so, so important, like the gentleman from Colorado said, that we employ an all-American energy strategy. And the irony is, 
we can do it here and now. There's no reason to wait, which is why I, I also have joined the gentleman. We are on the House Energy Action Team, or the HEAT Team, which is a group of like-minded members who believe we need that all-American energy approach, and we need it now. You, know, you spoke to some uh, natural gas issues. I'll tell you, in my neck of the woods in the great northwest, we get a majority of our energy from clean renewable hydropower. And the best thing about this clean renewable hydropower is it's inexpensive uh, compared with most other forms of energy, especially renewable energy. So not only is it carbonless and, and, it, and it's clean, but it's inexpensive and it's, it is constantly renewed in our backyard. You know, I, I, I wanted to point some of these things out because I don't believe hydropower always gets its due, especially among the renewables, but just as a, as a baseload energy source in the nation, um, hydropower is America's largest source of renewable energy. It's American energy. It's produced in America. The jobs that go into producing it are American jobs, and it's utilized here in America. It makes up 65.9% of all renewable energy in, in the United States, and it provides more than 30 million homes in the U.S. with inexpensive power. Hydro is clean. It avoids nearly 2 million metric tons of carbon emissions every year. This is a tremendous opportunity for us. You know, it's not only important for families, it does keep our energy bills low and affordable, but it's important for manufacturing. You know, we have in southwest Washington, in my area, in Camas and in Vancouver, a growing tech sector. We've traditionally been known for our forests um, and our, our beautiful dug fir stands, but we are also now becoming known for our um, silicon forests. We're manufacturing chips. And one of the reasons some of the large chip manufacturers have come to southwest Washington, um, as opposed to India or China, is because of the inexpensive energy, because of the hydropower. We need to not only protect it, but promote it as part of the all of the above energy approach, uh, which again is all American energy. You know, another area when we're talking about, uh, I mentioned clean, clean uh, types of renewables, uh, biomass, woody biomass, as a byproduct of the, the timber that we have in, our, in the great northwest. It's another area where we can produce carbonless or, or low form energy. Um, and it's in our backyard. We have an abundant source. It's an American energy source. Another byproduct of uh, timber manufacturing is, is black liquor. And this is not uh, liquor that you drink. It's liquor that can go into helping produce energy. These are the types of ideas and solutions that are going to make energy affordable for the average American family. These are the types of solutions that cause us, rather than to put onerous rules and regulations yeah. on, uh, oh, <laughs> I could name a few, that cause our energy to spike up and cause Americans to pay more. These are the types of solutions that actually meet the environmental standards, but also reduce the cost of the average power bill. I don't know about you. Uh, you could probably speak to this. Uh, mm. Martha, but man, our energy bills have gone through the roof, and there's no reason why when we've got American energy right here in our backyard. Sure, and I, you know, I can reiterate all of the points that the gentlelady from Washington makes, and you're right. I mean, you know, these are all things that contribute to uh, making life work for American families. I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, as we're having this conversation, um, I'm getting information that um, from from folks that want to make life work. And Mr. Speaker, I want to remind uh, all of us in this room that we remain committed to cutting spending and reducing the deficit and getting our debt under control. Uh, this conversation really all encompasses just that. Margaret and George, uh, and, and, and all of the families represented in this room tonight, they're the ones that we want to get this under control for because, Mr. Speaker, we want this country to be great for them as it has for all of us. But at the same time, there are things that fall under federal jurisdiction that we can be doing to making ease the burden on American uh, working moms and dads. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the things that we're talking about tonight. The Working Family Flexibilities Act of 2013, energy solutions that are out there. We're going to talk about health care and tax reform, but we're joined by Mr. Young from Indiana, 
And uh, thank you for coming, and please join the conversation. It's, it's great to be with the gentlelady, and, and, and thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, does the gentlelady yield here? I know we've got less uh, formal procedures. We don't have procedures. to yield. You can just we talk. We've got less formal procedures <laughs> underway. Yeah. Okay, well, great. Just like an American, uh, this is the great American family room, if you will, uh, <laughs> where we're sitting around and having a family conversation, uh, the people's conversation about uh, making life work. And, and uh, I would absolutely agree. Uh, there are a lot of dimensions to this topic. We've got to get our spending under control. Republicans have put forward uh, a bold budget to make that happen, uh, bring our budget into balance within just 10 years. Uh, we need to stop imposing uh, overly costly, overly burdensome regulations on American families, American businesses, and so on. Uh, we, of course, need to take a look at our energy policy and, and open up uh, this bounty of resources here in this country. And uh, there's a whole variety of different ones. Uh, my colleague from Washington, the gentlelady, just spoke to some in her region. Of course, in my region, uh, coal remains a, a viable and important resource, but uh, we're finding increasingly that my constituents in Indiana's 9th District uh, are enjoying the benefits of natural gas and uh, very affordable natural gas. We happen to have oil and gas resources in this con country by, by some reckoning uh, that are larger uh, than Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia combined. This will make the United States of America a net energy exporter within just 10 years. So that is a blessing that, uh, again, once again, Republicans are leading with respect to uh, harnessing uh, these resources we have. Of course, our human resources are, are another thing that uh, we could touch on. But really, I, my point of emphasis, since I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, this evening is going to be tax reform. We just finished getting through a, yet another tax day, and, and uh, uh, I'm sure my colleagues heard from their, their constituents just how convoluted and complicated and frustrating and unfair this tax code can be to working families. Um, you know, I, I was uh, struck by, there's this notion of, of Tax Freedom Day that uh, some of our colleagues and, and uh, certainly our constituents are aware of. This is when we as hardworking taxpayers stop paying the federal government and can start working for ourselves. And it fell on April 18 this year. Three and a half months into the year is when our taxpayers stopped paying the federal government and could start working for themselves and their families. That suggests to me that uh, we need to work on all fronts to grow this economy more and uh, also uh, to lighten the burden of taxation wherever possible. Tax simplification is, is uh, something I'll get into uh, in a little bit, but... Uh, uh, and that's uh, part of our overall tax reform effort. But uh, I, with, with that, uh, I'll, I'll yield to uh, my good friend from Colorado. Uh, perhaps you have other thoughts on taxation or other things that uh, are, are related to our making life work theme uh, tonight. Well, I, I thank the gentleman from yeah. Indiana for coming and joining us on the floor tonight. And Mr. Speaker, as we said, there are people across the country who are joining the conversation about making life work. They're uh, sending tweets with the hashtag making life work. In fact, uh, hearing from people who are indeed talking about tax reform uh, on this very issue, talking about what it means to work under a tax code that can be pro-job creation, that can actually lift the burden on American families by creating a fairer, flatter system. <coughs> and so uh, whether you're a small business who's just getting started or, or uh, you're a small business that's been around for a while, the fact is uh, the more, the, more uh, the burden that you pay from the government, whether it's a, a higher income tax or you're a, a subchapter S and you're you're paying at the individual level, that's less money that you get to spend investing into job creation, into expanding your employees, the number of people that you have working for you, the salaries that you can provide for them, the insurance, the benefits that you can provide. And so really tonight's discussion about making life work is about what we're doing to create a, a, a fair system that looks out for, for everyone. Uh, that looks out for people who are making minimum wage so that they won't be making minimum wage for long. They'll actually be getting a, a pay increase because their business is growing, because their salaries are able to, to get higher, because they're more successful in, in developing a product, in manufacturing. And so uh, a tax code that is pro-growth, pro-growth economics can lead to that. And I know you're in a great position to lead that discussion. Well, I just want to say to both of the gentlemen, um, you know, what we're talking about tonight is kitchen table stuff. Right? right? So Americans all across this country sit down across the table from their loved one and they balance their budgets. Why do we hold the federal government to any standard 
other than that. We're addicted to spending. We um, are, are on an unsustainable path for the next generation. Tax reform, energy, um, removing burdens on the working families. These are all such important concepts to um, making life work for American families. I, we're joined by another colleague. Um, I just want to introduce our newly elected uh, member of the House of Representatives joining us in the 213th Congress, um, Ms. Ann, or Mrs. Ann Wagner from Missouri. Uh, so the gentlelady from Missouri, please join us in this conversation and offer us your perspective. I'd, I'd be pleased to. Thanks so much for... Uh